Hey, what's up? This is Dave. This is Joshua. Hey, what's going on? This is Brandon. I'm Nick Principe, and this is PVD Horror. This is Hey, what's up? This is Angel from That Strange Show, and you're checking in with PVD Horror. Nice. Awesome. All right. All right. Oh, so and don't be don't be uh, caught off guard. There's gonna be race cars going by Josh's house every like three <laughs> three minutes. I have no idea why that's a thing, but it is. Uh, what are you in Grantston, dude? <laughs> <laughs> I live in Coventry. Yeah, man. So it's awesome to know that one of our favorite slashes is actually from our hometown. We make a joke every like every interview that we do with people not knowing what PVD stands for. So it's just like now we have someone that's from our hometown and we can talk about it. So what was it like growing up for in Rhode Island for you? Uh, I mean, uh, OK, well, I guess for the first part of my life as like a little boy. Um, I grew up in Federal Hill. OK. Um, like in the, the, the city, like like two blocks away from um, Owls Ave. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I grew up there till I was like 11. And then my mom's aunt moved to Florida. And then my family took over the mortgage payments of the house. And mm-hmm. that was in Warwick, uh, right. on Narragansett Parkway. I guess they just had the parade this yep. past Saturday. Yeah, Gatsby. It's the same fucking parade for 60 <laughs> years. It's the same yep. shit every year. Every yeah. year. <laughs> but um, yeah, so no, um, from like 11. Till I was about 17, 18, I lived in, in Warwick. And um, I mean, I don't know, average lower middle class family um, had a phenomenal relationship with uh, Video Express, the mom and pop video oh, okay. store, which was like yeah. four blocks down the road. Um, you know, anything but new releases were 99 cents a day. So I was like finding change all day, every day as a kid, just trying to rent movies, rent move that, that, that was it. Um, movies, comic books. And then, um, right around the same time of that move, my dad made me get into like martial arts and boxing and stuff. Cause, um, um, I believe that the, the nerd, the, the term for nerd that he used back then was, it was very eloquent. I think it was just, uh, Hey fag. Um, oh, man. I use that quite often um, because I like to draw and read. So clearly I was a, a homosexual. Um, but yeah, so comic books and movies um, just became like a false reality to me. Yeah. You know, um, horror movies, especially. Um, so, I mean, that was just basically it. And then uh, I got more into music and things like that. And I started playing in bands and that led me to spending more time in like Boston and things like that. And that was like the first thing that like got me to travel. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, I guess it's just a basic New England upbringing. You know, um, I, I remember when I first said, like, I'm like, I- I'm going to move to California. I think I remember like friends being like, where are you going to eat? You don't know where the restaurants are. You're gonna go out there and you're gonna get lost. And you're gonna don't do it, man. You know, and it's just like ah, no, I, I'm pretty sure they got like food out there and uh, you know, so man, stuff. You know? So I mean, G- everybody didn't have a GPS back then, so I guess I'll give them that. But yeah. uh, but still, like it, it's just shocking because um, as you, as you guys know. Um, be like, hey, hey, why don't we take a ride over to uh, East Providence quick? They got that great uh, pita shop that we eat over there. Yep. That's fucking 15 minutes away. <laughs> we might as well go to New York. Yep. You know, like that shit's <laughs> hilarious to me. Yeah, and man. even after like just spending like a day or two back in Rhode Island, how quickly I'm like, oh, I'm not fucking going there. Might as well fucking drive to Central America if we're fucking going, yep. there, you know? Yeah, that's, um, that's crazy because I had moved out to Arizona for like a year and a half. And then so my family, and, you know, you would see like how like most of it's desert. And so everything you have to want to go to, like probably like a half hour away. And so like like you just said, like we would complain about riding five minutes somewhere, you know, so yeah, I definitely get yeah. it. <laughs> I remember we were on tour with my old hardcore band, this guy in Texas. And he's like, I don't even 
You could tell, like, in his eyes, he didn't know what Rhode Island was. Yeah. He's just like, oh, yeah, New York. And, like, no, yep. no, down, <laughs> down. Um, but uh, I was like, yeah, I'm like, you could technically drive um, – from one end of the state to the other in 45 minutes. And he's yeah. like, takes me 45 minutes just to get to work every day. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I'm like, well, we don't do it. We don't go to Connecticut and Massachusetts. It's like, Oh, Hey, three o'clock time to make the, the city commute. But yep. you know, <laughs> yeah, I know you talked about video express. So what are some of the comic shops in the theater in the theaters that you had gone to man, starship Excalibur boy, fucking yeah. deck. It's not, it's actually, it used to be in a plaza. That was like a dollar theater across from McDonald's, and it was across the street from my junior high. It's now um, the I don't know if you know the the Walmart. That's Aldridge. In front of Aldridge Junior High. Yep. The junior high school is gone too, but the building yeah, it's is gone. gone. But the Walmart across the street from there was a comic book store called Starship Excalibur. Okay. And I used to go there, back in you know, every Wednesday. Every yep. Wednesday, oh, the dude every who Wednesday. the desk, he looked like a Vulcan. <laughs> Star Trek. You like? I think it was like premeditated. Okay. It like that, you know, mm -hmm. um, Starship Excalibur, um, Bat Boy Comics. That was in Wakefield. I think it's still there, actually. Yeah, I think I it think is. Yep. Wakefield. I used to go to Bat Boy, and then there was a Starship Excalibur uh, in Providence, I think. Mm -hmm. And as far as uh, theaters, Showcase Cinema on, yeah. um, you know, mm -hmm. what is it? Oakland, no, Oakland, like you know, down closer to to you, Josh, like towards Carter. The old we called it. We always called it old school Showcase. Bald Hills, yeah. Yeah, both, oh, yeah, yeah. Old school Pretty showcase today. versus mall showcase because I know they had yeah. Since yeah. Yeah. the mall showcase just shut down. Yeah, for yeah. good or yeah, yeah. COVID. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Crazy. You know? So, Nick, if you're talking comics, what what did you read? Because I love comics. Okay, um, as of late, like I still read comics. Um, on uh mostly mostly lately it's been a lot of batman stuff they've been doing a lot of different cool offshoots of batman um i actually learned how to read in kindergarten from this guy Pun oh, i don't think you see him yeah, I, I, my son's going through a punisher face i'm so happy yeah, yeah. I, sometimes you have to hide it though because like these days it's like if you're wearing this it may mean you're kind of this you know oh, yeah. like, it's, it's a little touchy there you know yeah. it's weird that comic books can come, come into that um i always kind of followed writers um i was a huge garth ennis fan to this day uh mark miller love anything that guy does um uh vertigo press I, I used to go a lot by like like companies like that like um like vertigo because i was into preacher and then some other ones so here's this this one i'm actually rereading you can see a reoccurring theme here uh, uh northlanders by brian wood okay it's the, it's the viking shit you know um that's really good uh another book he had that i loved a lot was called dmz about uh like a war barrier i, I guess i always kind of leaned more towards less superhero-y stuff and more just kind of stranger stories and things like that. Um, Boom Comics is pretty good. I just I just picked up Elf. Oh wow, that's funny. Yeah. I got a See, bunch I'm of mostly... Elf, and then I picked up uh, Strange Tales one seventy with Brother Voodoo. And I don't oh, know man. if you can see right there, little Dembella. <laughs> Made famous by Chucky, of course. Yeah, no, I know uh, the the voodoo guy because he was just recently in uh, Savage Avengers with uh, Punisher, Electra, Doctor Strange, and even Punisher. I see that skull, I just get it. And then yeah. see how like you get the old comics by going to, like antique stores and stuff. I'll buy them just just for the covers, just if I just like oh, the yeah. art, you know, stuff like that. But yeah, right. that was. That was my Rhode Island thing. A cable car. Is the cable car still there? Uh, they closed. Oh, yeah. man. They closed, yep. too. Man, I what saw it? Pulp Fiction for the first time in that theater when it first came out. And I was blown <laughs> away. Because they had, it was all... I mean, I'm sure they do it now, like hipster ones. But before the movie, they had, like, a guy playing guitar. They had couches instead of seats. Yep. Popcorn was all you could eat. And I thought the most brilliant thing that they did was they put speakers from the theater into the bathroom... So you yep. have to, if you have to go to the bathroom, you can still at least hear the movie. You know, I thought that was genius. Yeah. genius. But that, that, that sucks. But yeah, they closed pre-COVID, so that wasn't COVID-related. Oh, I, right. I don't know exactly why they did, but that was, yeah, that's unfortunate. That was kind of like a 
kind of like iconic, I guess. Um, sure. Avon's still going, right? Yeah, Avon? they're still going. Yeah, yeah. Avon. Yep. God. Smells but, like but the next time you're here, if you ever need directions, just go by the old cable car. Oh, yeah. Those good Rhode Island directions. Where the old cable car used to be, take a left. Go 14 Dunkin' Donuts down. Yeah, 14 Dunkin' Donuts. It's all Dunkin' Donuts, too. There'll be a too. retarded kid selling lemonade. <laughs> He'll tell you what to do. That's how you get that. Yeah. Now, let's talk about CTK, Closer Than Ken. How was Oof. it being a part of the Boston punk rock scene? Um, It was... Oh, man. Never is there a time of such carefree living mm -hmm. than when you're young and in a band that is lucky enough to get to tour. I was very like, I don't think you, you set out to do these things, you know, like I just really, I mean, to this day, I really like playing music, you know, mm -hmm. and punk, hardcore punk, that that's, that's my heart, you know? So it's just, you kind of just do your thing. And then one day you look up and it's like, Holy shit. Like, wow. You know, because I don't think anybody gets into that kind of music thinking like this is going to pay the bills or yeah. this is going to lead to something else. You just do it because it's just just fun as shit. Mm -hmm. And you're just surrounded by your friends, you know. Yeah. So next thing you know, you know, you're just playing shows. And then you start going up the East Coast and then you're going on tour and then you get like a little label backing. So now you're going to Europe and you got all these like-minded people around the world and you got friends almost anywhere you can go. You're fucking broke as shit, yeah. <laughs> but you're happy. And mm -hmm. I know that I'll never have that in my life ever again. Or you, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's such carefree, like, well, you know, when I get home, I need a job. But then if we get an offer for a tour again, I'm just going to quit that fucking job. I'll lose my apartment or whatever and figure it out when I get back. You mm -hmm. know, it was just fun. It was it's just cool. I, I think it's good for anybody uh, at one point or another, just just to be a part of something that's just much bigger than yourself. You know, yeah. Now, a lead singer, actor, stuntman, director and a producer. It seems like you went all out and you just lived your dream. Not many people can do that. What pushed you to accomplish these things? See, I don't think I've ever heard it phrased the way you just did. Yeah. Because um, I always just looked at it as as soon as you make this your your life, it's it's now your profession. Mm -hmm. um, you you're gonna do whatever you can within that field to to try to get a paycheck mm -hmm. you know because i mean if it was up to me if everybody if someone just took care of my food and lodging and things like that i could do my shit for free for the rest of my life but it just isn't like that now i got kids i got a wife um you really have to see like i think when people first start in the film business you're just there because you just love movies so much you know, you just want to be a part of it. You know, you want to be in, in the process. And I think people learn really quick. There's a huge difference between just watching movies and making them because making them can be absolutely soul crushing. You know, yeah. you can get so close to something and then have it yanked away from you or never even have that chance and spend all this time. Because it's not like being a doctor where you go to school for seven years and when you get out, you know, you're going to be a doctor. You could bust your ass in this business for seven years and absolutely nothing could come. No. I guess to, to make it simple, I've never been afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not scared to fail. And I think that's the advice I would give to anybody. I think more people are concerned about like, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? What are people going to say? You can't, you can't do that. You got to just follow your heart. If you truly believe that, something's your passion that you have to just you have to just do it and at least if it doesn't work out then at least you know that you tried you yeah. can't just sit back and just wonder because i mean my true idea of health is that right before you die you meet the person that you could have been if you if you did everything that you were passionate about if you went to try uh everything that you failed at this person succeeded and he looks you in the eyes and he's just like you fucked up here you fucked up here you fucked up there blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. See, it, you know yeah. that would be like my idea of hell so no matter how stupid or ridiculous or just whatever um just just try forget what anybody says man go with your heart your heart if, if, if i mean okay hold on 
if you're a good person, if you're a good person, go with your heart, you know, because I don't think it can steer you wrong. You know, everything happens for a reason. It's it's very tough. Um, But I think me pursuing movies from music was, I was just burned out. Um, I didn't have a whole lot to show for it except for some stories and some good times. And there's nothing wrong with that. But um, my band was dissolving. I was pretty much homeless and I was about 23 years old and I was like, Jesus, God, what, what do I do? You know? And it was like, well, what do you like doing? Um, I really like smoking weed. I really like movies and I really like music. I'm like, I don't think weed's going to be too much money or make a living. Uh, I don't think, yeah, music. No, it's fun. But it was like, like maybe I could just work on movies. I'm like, it'd be really cool to be a monster in a movie. Always wanted to do that, but I'd settle for just working in a movie. Mm-hmm. So I had some friends uh, in the band Death by Stereo who lived in Orange County, and I just stayed with them for a while. And um, yeah, that was it. That was fucking 17 years ago, something like that. Oh man, that's awesome. You know, that is there awesome. You go. So. Yeah, so 17 years ago, and here we are today. And as of now, your acting credits are 67 acting roles. And yeah. I'm sure that and I'm sure that's growing. Like I'm sure wow. you're not you're yeah. not done yet. 67. That's that's awesome. All right. And, and that, that's just acting. That's not like that was just from, acting. Just, I right. believe, I believe it was <laughs> yeah, no, I'm so I don't mean to tell you short. Because yeah, there was like no, 40... no, no, no. I just I've never heard this number. I don't fucking look online anymore. No. I, I believe there was <laughs> no. like uh 14 stunt uh stunt roles, and then you also have writing and directing, um, which it looks like you might have done some work with some short films. Yeah, um the, the shorts they're just you know. <sighs> I guess you just call them exercises, maybe, yeah. you know, um, I think everybody and their mother wants to be a director and thing is anybody and their mother could be a director if hired. It's not hard to direct. It's really not. Um, I think it's really hard to be like a visionary director, sure. Sure. but that's not really something you can be taught. I don't think. You know, um, I, I I truly believe that the, the story ends up, well, first off, of course, your script. Your script's got to be great. But well, most of the story is really told in editing. You know, how you mix things around, move it up, flash cuts, things like that. But i um, losing track of myself. The Like I said, I just, just always wanted a job. And I think producing came with just being in the business for so long. Because, like, the term producer... I think like I'm gonna to try to demystify it a little bit because I think you're like, oh, that dude's a producer. You think he's paid, he's got serious bank, like mm-hmm. makes movies, things like that. Sometimes a producer can just be as simple as, hey, I heard you know David Arquette. Do you think he'd want to be in my movie? Um, I don't know. I can hand him the script. I'm a producer now. Nah. <laughs> you know, now executive producers, they're responsible for like finding money and doing things, and that is a task <laughs> that is is super valuable you know that that's tougher but a producer is just kind of somebody who puts some people together you know like oh you know i need a cameraman i got a cameraman for you he's fucking awesome but you should definitely hire him oh i need a sound guy too so if you've just now gotten like three or four jobs for a production you're now a producer Mm -hmm. you know so it's not too hard to come into that um writing was something something i definitely kind of just fell into where I just have a lot of friends that were writers or producers and you'd just be talking and they're like, you know, this guy, he's kind of stuck at this or we don't know what to do with act two to go into act three or this or that. And I would just be like, Oh, why don't you do this? Blah, blah, blah. So like a little bit of that after a while, they're like, why don't I just hire you to write it? I'm like, if you want to, <laughs> you know, because my grammar is awful. Um, I do run on sentences, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, that's why I was like, I'm like, I can never be a writer. I'm I'm not good at that. They're like, hell no, just get it done. Like, we'll get somebody else to fucking just clean it up. But Mm -hmm. it's the ideas and shit. So I've been really lucky with that for sure. In your, in those 67, um, credits for, for acting roles, there's definitely some films that you've worked on that the horror community would recognize like 
without a doubt, like Hatchet 2, Tales, from, Tales of Halloween, Extremity, Late to Rest. Um, but I was wondering, are there any of like the lesser talked about films or lesser known films that you really enjoyed and you feel like deserve some notoriety and for people to go, should go check out? Complete honesty, horror wise. No, no <laughs> those are it. Those are it. Yeah. Um, I got, I got to say out of those 60 some odd movies, um, I'm probably like proud of about five. Okay. You know, I mean, I, I won't lie to you. I, I, I hate it when actors or whatever are like, oh, you should, I'm in this movie, so you should go see it. The fuck you should, just because you're <laughs> like, just because I'm in a movie, that, I, I'm not telling you to see it because it's it, that makes it great. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make it great. I mean, sometimes, you know, plumbers don't turn down jobs when they get a call, you know? I mean, if it's just something really stupid and I have turned down, a, I mean, right after Late to Rest, it seemed like I was getting a slasher movie a week. And if I could make a career of just doing slasher movies, I would have. But they're fucking so bad. They're yeah. just so bad. And everybody thinks that they got the the newest, hottest, greatest thing. You know, and then you read it. And, and in your mind, you know, a horror fan is instantly referencing everything that you've ever seen before that possibly this person hasn't even fucking seen. So maybe they think. <laughs> Yeah, they're doing like an original idea, but it's not, you know, Mm -hmm. and the things that kind of like get me excited to say like something like Tales of Halloween, not fucking reinventing the wheel. It's just taking formulas and classics that horror fans that that we fucking love and we want to see. So they made like an anthology of like those kind of things, because that's like one of the rare occasions where like Tales of Halloween, everybody involved in that is a horror fanatic. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's not just a gig. Th- those are the rough movies to make when you meet a director and the writer who are just writing a horror movie because they know that horror is a built-in market. We're probably going to see it regardless. And then, you know, they don't even care if you like it or not. They got your fucking few bucks or whatever. So on to the next one. You know, it, you know there's no romantic comedy conventions. You know, there's no drama conventions or even action movie conventions. There's horror movie conventions and there's superhero shit, you know, mm-hmm. but our convention has been around for a while and people capitalize on that, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it's up to us to kind of weed through all that shit, you know? Yeah. But um, I guess like some of the other ones, they, they, they wouldn't be horror that I'm like really proud of. Um, I, I started an action movie called uh, American Muscle. Okay. Yeah. Super revenge, over the top, violent, low budget thing. Um, we actually um, a movie called Vault. Okay, you heard this one. I was that actually was, just about to probably, ask you about that. Yeah. Okay, that was probably like the most pride I had working in the film, and I really, really wish that my dad was still alive for it because he was friends with all the guys that this is about. I mean, Vault yeah. is about you know a true story of Rhode Island mm-hmm. um, because you know. There's never been any kind of mafia activity in Rhode Island. No, never. Ever. <laughs> not, not in the Federal Hill area at all, ever, either. Specifically, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I only remember being in fourth grade and watching a 2020 on Buddy Stiancy in 2020. <laughs> telling, I'd never even heard the word Rhode Island on TV before. Yeah. This yeah. 2020 special where they said we're the most corrupt state in the nation. Yeah. Hey, but, but Buddy got shit done. <laughs> hey, man, that's what they said. He can go to jail for five, six years. He can get out. He get reelected, man. He was, yeah. he was he almost did. people. He almost did. He went when he got out of jail. He had a radio show and he was like, Oh, I think I'm gonna run for office. Yeah. And unanimously, yeah. everyone wanted to vote for him and he pulled himself out. Yeah. Ah, that's too bad. He was, I don't know if they ever got a movie out about him. They were supposed to. Yeah, they should. Um, the guy uh, Michael Carenti was about doing it. Something I heard of it. It was based on that book, The Prince of Providence. Okay, um, yep. I don't know. But um, but Vault, I'm super proud of. Um, I got to work with uh, Clive Standen, Rolo from Vikings. Yeah. And he's become a great fucking drinking buddy. He's a great dude. Love that guy. Theo Rossi, he was super cool. Chaz Palminteri, Don Johnson. I'd, I'd heard yeah. bad things about him, but he was yeah. actually like really cool. Yeah. Um, Tom DiNucci, who's a Rhode Island filmmaker, <laughs> yep. and a, um, he's my daughter's god godfather um he's a, he's a, uh, okay. a great personal friend 
I think I've worked with him on almost everything that he's that he's done on some level or not. I think he just gives me like a courtesy call because I think he just enjoys having me around more so sure. than anything else, you know. But that that's what you want. I mean, any job is that much better when you have friends around you. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, he's got a lot of great things in the works. There's actually um, I just dug myself a little something here. We kind of got hired to, I'll, I'll simplify as much as I can. We kind of got hired to write a third sequel to a set of movies that no one asked for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got hired to that and then something changed and it had to be a standalone thing. And it kind of turned into like this, like Devil's Rejects kind of road movie and then they get to their location and it turns into just a straight up slasher movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. The working title for before was like Jungle Room or something like that. But I think we're going to shoot it in October. Um, something that me and him both wrote. It should be interesting. So we were actually talking about uh, something that I was going to ask you about anyway. So I'm, I'm like, so glad you got on the subject. I kind of stumbled on a uh, Tom DiNucci film recently uh, called uh, Almost Mercy. And right. I was at, it was actually, I do this post on Instagram where I, I, I drink a beer and I try to get like, have a witty connection to a movie. And uh, John Stamos was on the beer and I was thinking of his phrase in Full House where he's like, have mercy. So I found a movie called Almost Mercy. I start watching uh, it. And then I realized that the film's set in Rhode Island. I'm like, whoa, what the, what the hell? So I look it up and Tom DiNucci is from, I guess he's from East Greenwich or somewhere like that. Cranston, yeah. Cranston, the, the production Cranston. offices are in, are in uh, Cranston. Did and you notice me in there or did I do a good job? So I actually, so I, I like, I just kind of mindlessly watched. And then I was reading in more about the film after, cause I was like, I want to know everything about it. And I saw you were in there. So yes, you're one of the orderlies in that film, which is amazing. <laughs> and I was like, so small world. Like we always talk about if you're from Rhode Island, you always say small world, Rhode Island. Like everybody is mm-hmm. connected to some, everybody, but here I sure. am like, watching a fucking movie on Tubi and then I've run into all these different connections. So yeah, you guys, so you, you were telling us that he is the goddaughter, the godfather of- He's a godfather of my daughter Ripley, yeah. So yeah. you guys, did you guys, like, what was that like working with him and like, just like having this connection, even though you're in California now and you guys are still doing stuff together. That's amazing. We, we actually shacked up because- um something like maybe like 11 years ago or so i was just home visiting um just i i tried i didn't do it this year i probably won't be able to this year but i I, you know i love rhode island the summer rhode island the summer is the the best you Mm -hmm. know so i try to come by for like like a few days or something like that and just hang out and i told a couple people i'm like hey i'm gonna be you know, just ha- kind of hanging out with my mom for a little bit and some friends in Rhode Island. And I was just, just hanging out. And this other, oh God, he escapes my name. We, we called him, <laughs> I know his nickname. We called him the rug because he wore a hairpiece. But um, <laughs> he was like, he's like, hey, he's like, there's this um, little indie production um, going to be shooting Cranston. I'm like, what? That's awesome. Like, are you kidding me? And they're like, they need a stunt coordinator. I'm like, they're like, do you want to meet the kid? And I met Tom and he was just fucking great. You know what I mean? He was like new in the business and no pretension to him whatsoever. Just a, a wide eyed kid who had a script <laughs> and got the chance to direct and all this stuff. Yeah. And he was cool as hell. So I was like, I'm going to help these dudes out as much as I possibly can. And um, yeah, he's become, he's, he's, you know, he's like a brother. And um, just about everything he's done, I've had like a little something to do with it in one way or another. But um, I was just so stoked to work on a movie in Rhode Island. You know, I didn't think that would ever happen. Yeah. Yeah. And now you've done two. That's how we met on that one. Oh, yeah. No, no. I've done a few since. Um, Another Tom DiNucci movie called Army of the Damned. Okay. Uh what do you call it vault yeah almost mercy purge three okay Tom, oh, was filmed in Woonsocket. Working on that, but I, I did stunts on that we did we did purge three like mostly in fucking womb socket yeah, of all yeah. Places. over by the stadium i believe right? yeah 
over there. Um, we were downtown for a little bit on the east side, uh, like uh, an offshoot of a uh, Wicked and Street. That was an interesting one because um, I knew the second AD on that movie. And he just calls me up out of the blue. And he's like, you're from Rhode Island, right? I was like, yeah, yeah. Born and raised, 401. Woo. And um, he's like, he's like, hey, he's like, you should talk to the stunt coordinator. He's like, we're shooting in Rhode Island. You can work as a local. Which means I would have to fly myself out and put yourself up. But that's not hard in Rhode Island. You know, it was yeah, like yeah. a $300 ticket. So anyways, I got hired for two weeks of work on that. And I was like, I'm like, that's amazing. It's like, you know, budgets at that level, like your payday, you do very little and you make like three times the money that you normally would. Sure. So anyways, I was hired for two weeks. I ended up working on the movie for two months because almost about 95% of all the stunts in that movie, um, people were wearing masks. So it was very easy to, to recycle people. So I got hired for two weeks and basically anything with a mask in it you, that I'm in there at some point. And then the only time I'm not wearing a mask is there's like a shootout in a, a church in Woonsocket. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was, that was the only time you see me without a mask. But yeah. There's probably a couple other movies too that I'm just, I'm just not thinking of. There did was, have, um, did you work on the Vinnie Paz movie with, with him? Didn't he have some involvement in that? Oh no, no, no. Yeah, no. He, um, um, one of the people that Tom worked, Tom's in that movie for a bit, but no, I couldn't do that because I was, uh, I was in Austria working okay. on, um, some German TV show okay. over there. I actually found some decent work. I don't think my IMDb shows it, but, um, um, they fucking love Chrome Skull in Germany. Yeah. Horror is so big in Germany. Um, I'm definitely more of a, and I hate this term, but like a celebrity over there than I am here. And I got some random offers for like, I guess the equation of like German soap opera kind of stuff and some just kind of hokey TV movie things. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, so I wasn't able to do the, the Vinnie Paz movie, which would have been rad. Yeah, um, for sure. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's any reason to come to Rhode Island is a good reason, I think, unless somebody's dead. Um, <laughs> so to be able to to make a few bucks and just hang out in Rhode Island is always like a welcome yeah. phone call, you know. I I just wanted to do a quick plug just to connect back to that conversation we're having about the vault. For any listen listeners, if you guys want to hear about all that stuff, listen to the uh, podcast Crime Town. Season one was all Rhode Island uh, oh. mob stuff, and they talk about so that good. that heist in there amongst tons of other great mafia stories. So definitely. Um, that's cool that like a film was able to be made about that. And it's actually filmed in Rhode Island. So it, it, it's, it's streaming on Hulu um, vault. So people can check. Yeah, it out. I think it's still on Amazon prime too. Um, and not to be confused with the vault, the vault. Yeah. which is a James Franco. Yeah. Kind of yeah. horror heist thing. This is just vault. Yeah. Yep. That's confused. A few people who are like, yeah. I heard you did a movie. That's not a horror movie. So I can watch it. <laughs> but then I watched it and you wasn't in it. <laughs> no. yeah. Brandon, he's got your voices down, man. Uh, it sounded like Brandon right there. <laughs> oh, I, I fucking the New England accent. You you guys aren't even that heavy. You no, really no, Josh, Josh is no. probably the most out yeah, of the Josh. Just wait. Just wait. I'll be I'll be like you driving the car, park over there, you know, but, all that. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's like I, every time I talk to my mom for five minutes, I get off the phone and I talk to my wife. I'm like, we got to get this fucking uh, done quick. It's uh, they're calling for it on Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I said, tu <laughs> I said Tuesday to somebody out here. They're like, Tuesday? Tuesday? Yeah. Tuesday. So I said, Tuesday. <laughs> what, you got a fucking hot of hearing? <laughs> yeah. How do you say remember... Warriors? The what? The Warriors? Warriors? Oh. What you got? See, what? Warriors, right? Warriors. I it see, reminds you of that old episode of Reno 911. And there's this, uh, I forget the exact premise, but there's like this old black guy and he's blind. And the cops are trying to convince him that they're black too. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, say sweet potato. And they're like, sweet potato. Nah, you ain't black, you white. Because <laughs> <laughs> everything's a pronunciation. Uh, <laughs> say sweet potato. That's awesome. 
It was funny. I was actually down in Baltimore like a couple years back, and I was like, "Oh, where's the water bubbler?" <laughs> bubbler. bubbler, yeah, bubbler, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. Sure, grinders yeah. and nobody says cabinets anymore, though. No, back that was like my mom's day. Yeah, they talk yeah, about yeah. a milkshake. They call it a cabinet. You know, yeah. but that's been that's been uh, retired. Sure, but there's plenty of wieners. Wieners. <laughs> the gag is funny. Fucking story, right? So, uh, William Forsythe, who's also in Vault, right? He's been uh, a like a mentor to me over the years. He's a fucking phenomenal human being. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were out like a couple days before filming, and he's been, he actually had a house in Rhode Island, Warwick Neck. William oh, Forsythe shit. lived in Rhode Island. Oh huh. shit. He did a movie like maybe like eight years ago here or something. And he like fell in love with it and he bought a house and he fucking lived out. And um, he's like, he's like, Nikki, he's like, let's go, uh, let's go get a couple of drinks. And uh, then you, you show me what these hot wieners are. <laughs> I was like, like, really? You want it? Like, it's like, he's a little overweight, but like, he eats healthy. I don't like, I don't know. I'm like, you want to eat one? He's like, well, you know, he's like, I got to eat one for the scene. I just want to see what one of them are. Oh, right. And God. I'm like, you know what? I'm like, I haven't had a fucking hot wiener in like close to a fucking decade. I'm like <laughs> one coffee milk and yep. four all the way. Right. Yeah. Yes. So I mean, and like two in, I'm like, Oh, I see why I don't eat these things. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and his face watching me eat it. He was just like, no, <laughs> No, you know? <laughs> not and on it. the day he requested a spit bucket. Uh, so like he would just like eat, chew, talk, then he'll uh, cut. Yeah, he just <laughs> spit. So good though. Come on. Uh, you know, because the thing in mind too, it was like we were shooting at the Superman building downtown, and somebody had to run to Onlyville to get wieners, come back. They probably sat there yeah. for about an hour before you would shoot and so like those things have a shelf life of about like 40 seconds yeah. you know so we had to chew into that he was just spitting it. it was just like oh man yeah i'm like it's much better with the coffee milk i don't know what's <laughs> i was i was just watching him uh two nights ago in the movie dear mr gacy and mm. He he is amazing in that film because i always see him as like the like he you know and um devil's rejects isn't he like a, he's like a tough rugged like cop guy sheriff guy and then he's playing john gacy and he's like just he's just out there so good bill is oh he's just bill like i feel very lucky to know him another guy who was involved too was uh andrew divoff which you all know from uh wishmaster yep. and like those things yeah the level of intelligence that these men have and when you see acting and you're like, oh, I could do that. That seems easy. It's it's not because it's easy. It's just because they are just so fucking good at it, you know? And it's a, there's a reason why they make the money that they do. It's because they show up, researched and prepared, and they get it in one take and you move on. Or like two takes or something for different angles, you know? Yeah. That guy, Andrew Divoff, he can speak... He says nine languages fluently. And then he's like, there's like four that I'm okay with. And he's being <laughs> modest because he's fucking, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's yeah. like Romanian, fucking Russian, Ukraine, like all these different things. And it comes from a level of Andrew Divoff, just for an example, don't ever call this man just a creature performer by any means, okay? When he did that movie with Harrison Ford, uh, K-19, The Widowmaker, mm-hmm. where he played a Russian, so most people would maybe try to spend some time with some Russians to get the accent right or something. No, this motherfucker learns Russian. He <laughs> learns Russian so he can get the accent right. Like, that's just the kind of dedication. Like, I don't think people are, yeah. you know, and he's not like some young guy starting out. You know what I mean? This was like in like the late 90s. He'd already been working for like 15 years. With, you know, fucking learn Russian. Nobody told him to do that. He did that on his own just to yeah, be crazy. better at the craft. Yeah. You know, and that's the level of actor you're dealing with, like him and, and, and Bill. You know? sure. So speaking of uh, great acting, can you tell me <laughs> how you were in Sky Sharks? Ah! 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> Just for a record, if you guys got no place to be, we can say I, I, I blocked out the evening. The wife's watching the kids. We can chat as much as you guys need. <laughs> so Sky Sharks, almost everything has like a little story to it. And the best way I could say, right, is there's some movies, I, ca I call them convention movies. Because you guys you guys go to horror conventions and yeah, stuff, I, right? Yep. Yeah, you notice yeah. how it's like, it's kind of like almost always the same, like usual suspects. It would be like Sid Hay, God bless his soul, yeah. yep. Bill Mosley, Kane Hodder, Derek Mears. Blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like the same thing, right? And you'll see these movies where it's just like a list of those guys. And those are all movies that like people from conventions would go and be like, hey, I don't know how to even get in touch with an agent. Will you be in my movie for this amount of money? Blah, blah, blah. And they just go table to table and you'll see like, and, like that's how they got those people, okay. there, right? Sky Sharks is the mother of all convention movies because it was shot in Germany and I was already going out there for a horror convention and they were like, if we put you up and fly you out a day earlier, would you work on our movie for a day? I was like, um, I really don't want to because, <laughs> you know, those conventions, it, Look, I love meeting the fans and those conventions are great, but they are exhausting, and especially yeah. in Germany, because it's just like you get there and from like 9 a.m. to 8 p.m., you're expected to just like sit there and sign. And if you're like up or away at your table, they're like, where are you? You are under contract. You are here to sign. Now sign. If they could have you hanging from a hook, a meat hook in a refrigerated area where you could just sign. For 72 hours straight, <laughs> they would do it. So I was kind of hesitant to take on a movie like right before doing all that. But then I talked to my friend Dave Sheridan. He was doing it. And a bunch of other people were doing it. So I was like, all right, now I, I guess I have to do it if everybody's doing it. And they were <laughs> shooting that airplane scene at the warehouse next door to the horror convention. Because, like, they'd have to, like, stop shooting at times so it would, like, just get too loud or something and they'd be, like, bitching about it. Be like, well, you know, I guess this could, falls on the fucking idiot who thought it'd be a good idea to shoot next to a convention. <laughs> like, you know? Um, so that's how I got shacked up with that. And then I ended up needing to do reshoot some other stuff, so they flew me back out again for Holy it. Shit. Um, and it's one of those movies that you just, like, ah, this will never see the light of day. Like that's what the world's been waiting for is a zombie zombie Nazi shark movie. Yeah. That's what that's what we've been all been waiting for. And then it came out. It was like kind of cool. Like it wasn't bad, right? Like I waited two years for that movie. I'll have oh, you know. God. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I was like the only one who watched it when it came out. I've been that guy. I've been that guy plenty of times. <laughs> oh, I think everyone was in that movie. Like you said, everyone. And when you started talking about Germany, I was like, "Oh, I got to talk about this film." Like that was the. But that, that's that was why the they got everybody in it, because everybody was already there, you know. So I think all it takes is for like one person to agree to it, then they can be like, "Well, you know, well, so and so said yes." And you're like, well, "I yeah. want to be invited to the party too," so you know. But yeah. um, yeah, that's awesome. I don't know. The uh, so then my my other big question, how the fuck did you get in a Slayer video? Man, there are a lot of lows in this business, a lot of lows, and when the highs come, they make it all worth it. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, the day <laughs> I got a phone call for that, I didn't even know that much about it. Um, I was just hired as a stunt man, and they said it's a music video. And they told me the rate. And I was like, I'm like, oh wow, it must be like a like a bigger kind of band, you know? Cause like I've done like as I lay dying videos. I'm not a fan. I don't really like that mall metal. So then then I got the Chevelle video. And then it was like right before um I didn't get the call sheet, like the email, and I called my contact and I was like, hey, um, I didn't get um like the directions and the times to be there for tomorrow. He's like, oh, oh, hold on one second. And he sent it. And I'm looking at the top of the call sheet. And I'm like, this is a fucking Slayer video? <laughs> and 
And they're like, oh, I didn't tell you that? He's like, yeah, no, I thought you'd be stoked on that. And I was like, you lead with that. You lead with that. It's a yeah, video. Yeah. <laughs> like, you lead with that. What do you mean? Oh, I got on all their music video. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> It was a fucking, and it's like their coolest video ever. And it was like, I was surrounded by friends. I had fucking Tony Moran, you know, the first yeah. Michael Myers, yeah. Tyler Main, he's my boy. Derek Mears yeah. is there. Um, Vernon from fucking Road Warriors, Sean Whalen, Jason Trost. It was just a big party, man. It was awesome. And then, so the first day, um, I, was a, I was a prisoner. I was a prison guard. And then the second day was when the band was there. And then I was one of the, the, the riot shield guys who gets like his ass kicked as like all the inmates are like trying to get at him. But my God, talk about like a fucking dream day, man. I mean, you were literally just hanging out with Slayer for a fucking whole day and like talking. And like the, the biggest thrill for me was Gary Holt in the Rolling Stone interview that he does he talked about me the whole time because there's like one scene where like he's like I'm holding all the prison guard uh, prisoners back, and then he yanks me down to the ground, and he was doing it like really light, and I was like I was like bro I'm like you know, I'm, I'm I'm a stunt man I'm like I'm like I'm like tear into me I'm like give me give me something good on this one, and he told that story and, I, and, and anybody who knew me because he, he's like there's like this six foot twenty guy he says don't <laughs> worry Gary I'm a stunt man just throw me down. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> so that actually led to um slayer did this like little 20 minute short film to tie in the three videos it was i don't know if you remember but like i think it was like last no not last summer maybe last winter um but they had that short film play with the three videos and then it was a live concert and it was at uh it was played in theaters for like one night and then I went to Blu-ray or whatever. But yeah, so they shot this short film. And um, uh, yeah, I got, <laughs> it's another funny one. I got hired on that to play a skinhead. But I had to wear a bandana over my head because I was growing my hair out for vault. Uh. So I was like, I'm going to get fired. Like, what's what's the, the key rule of playing a skinhead? You got to have a fucking shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. showed up there with like. Yeah. Uh, one job. You know, you know I was one, just job. Like, ah. one job. <laughs> Like, I understand if you tell me to fuck off. You know? <laughs> so that Dude, was that really was cool, cool, man. Fucking, I got a picture. I'll, I'll, I'll find it somewhere. I have it in my phone. But, um, you know, I never asked for autographs. I might ask for a handshake here and there or a picture. When I saw Tom Araya, I was like, I was like, Dude, I got to get a picture, please, please. And he's like, yeah, of yeah. course. And I was in my full riot gear. He instantly shrunk down to his knees looked up to me and did like a fake yell just because i was so tall so i'm like looking down at him like this time <laughs> right i'm looking like petrified at me it's fucking oh my god i hope my kid's gonna kick out of that someday as much yeah. as i still do as much so just so you know i play slayer all the time in the car i, I drive my son to school every day there and back it's like an hour and a half a day just me and him in the car and today i yeah. was playing slayer i'm like i'm interviewing the guy that was in this video today he's like dad can we just turn this off? Like, no, no, you don't understand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's something I'm so scared of, too. Just be like, I don't know. Like, I get some, like, big movie, and I'm, like, bring my kids out. They're like, oh, it's in. And they're just like, is he in Minecraft? Because if not, I don't fucking <laughs> care. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, what YouTube yeah, station is he on? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think Rick and Morty summed it up best when he's like making fun of him, and he goes, "Your generation is a generation that watches YouTube videos of people watching YouTube videos." Yes, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fucking ridiculous. My kids are watching videos of people playing with toys. I'm like, shut this shit off now, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dude. Yeah, no, my my son too. It's and it, it's just like I'm like. Who are the fucking pedophile weird ass freaks that are putting these videos together? You're a grown ass man playing with toys. Like, does anyone else find that fucking bizarre? <laughs> you know? It's weird times, man. You said it best. It's weird times. So, all right. So I wanted to get into um Late to Rest a little bit. Um, so you know, we are huge fans of Late to Rest. Um, I think that this is probably the film that 
I know when I when when Brandon and I first became friends, this was one that he had let me borrow. And I feel like I remember like early friendship discussions about late to rest. So I have a little bit of nostalgia for that. And um, so this was, you know, really cool when I when I realized that there was this Rhode Island connection. I was like, oh, shit, this is this is it, it almost seems like one of those things where it's just like, yeah, you know, the, the killer, he's from here. Bullshit, dude, yeah. fucking liar. He's not yeah. right here. No, I'm telling you, I heard my cousin's girlfriend <laughs> dated this guy who knew him. I'm telling you. He worked at the Best Buy on Bald Hill. Swear to God. Swear to God, dude. Swear to God. That's like my, my wife's favorite phrase is, swear to God, dude. Swear to God. Swear to God. Swear to God. God you're dude. my friends. They're like, nah, you're bullshit. No, I swear to God, dude. So she's <laughs> it all the time. She's like, ah, swear to God, dude. Swear to God. <laughs> But yeah, that that that's funny, man. So I guess uh, before I start talking about late to rest, I just kind of wanted to acknowledge the recent passing of Robert Greenhall, um, who was the creator of that film. He passed on May twenty fourth um, of this year, and it, it kind of like you know it's weird because like I know it was you know it was out on some like horror media, uh, but like it kind of felt like it happened and like it wasn't too widely known. So, I mean, there's probably people that are going to listen to this and not even realize that it happened, which is unfortunate. Um, so like one of the questions I wanted to ask you was like, what was it like to work with him and, you know, him being like a special effects master, um, what was he able to bring to that film that you feel like made it unique with his like set of skills with the special effects? Oh God. Um, Rob, was the horror nerd that made it. Rob grew up in an extremely rural Alabama town. Um, he got his start doing effects on like goofy haunted houses. And to my knowledge, he would like work on stuff in his free time because he worked he worked at a Tyson chicken plant as a kid, like deboning chickens as like a 17 year old kid. OK, that had to fuck with yeah, your head yeah. a little bit, yeah. you know. Um, so he would work year round for the month of October to these haunts. Right. And then one day, uh, Abel Ferrara's remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers was shooting like nearby and he got like an internship and he left his job. He worked for free on that movie and then moved to California with fucking maybe like 600 bucks or something like that. And he got a car and he lived in his car. and. He then worked with absolute legends like Steve Johnson, yeah. the man who gave us Slimer, or almost, you know, he worked with Rob Boutine, he worked with KD. And he had a hard reputation with other makeup artists, but I truly think and everybody called him a dick, but not in general, just just like other some other makeup artists and things like that, not in general. But I think he just, you know, he slept in his car for like years and would be early to work and stayed late. And he worked his ass off to open up his company. And I just think he is like, if you want to be a makeup guy in this biz, you have to like work as hard as I did. Or yeah. is it the way at least I, I saw it? So I yeah. think his perception could of that, can you know, people could easily say it's a dick, but. You know, he's just one of the most dedicated people to his craft I'll, I'll ever know. What he brought to that movie is something that only an effects artist could bring to a slasher film or a horror film like that. Because much like in stunts, when you have like a good director who trusts his stunt coordinator, they let the stunt coordinator direct the fight scene. Like no dialogue or any things like that, but camera moves for best angles for the hits and things like that. You trust your stunt coordinator to kind of shoot those things. So in a lot of the higher budget horror movies, he would be allowed to shoot the effect scenes to get the best angles for his jobs and best mm -hmm. makeups. And so that's going to teach you a lot of things across the way. And then 
the biggest thing outside of his, his, his vision of the film was he did all the effects. So now this movie, like the first movie, I think it had like a, like a, like a million dollar budget, something around there. And the second one was like a little bit less because on the first movie, that was like about a million dollars in special effects right there. So it was at cost to him, which that's still like $300,000, like total. That's like just out of pocket to make it happen, yeah. not be paid for it, you know? Sure. So he brought that level of craftsmanship to the effects that just, you know, a lower budget movie like that just, just would have no rights or possibility to do that, you know? Um, you know, he had DPs that were like, you know, Brandon Trost, the DP, uh, that he's like Seth Rogen's fucking DP now. And like, he directed that, that pickle movie that he just did. And he's like the DP on all Lonely Islands videos, things like, you know, it's mm -hmm. like 50 grand just to get this guy to do a fucking location scout these days, you know? Mm -hmm. So he's always known like higher level work. Whereas like most low budget horror films, you're taking what you can get, like people that are kind of new in the business and they don't know much about, you know, Rob was able to hire like nothing but professionals and things like that. So I think it really, really stood out in that sense. And that's definitely what he brought to the table. Yeah. Yeah. That, that film, like I knew is like from the, it, the, the knife through the face scene, as soon as that yeah. happened, I was like, this movie is going to, the classic. That's Scott Ian's favorite scene too. Uh, he fucking um I remember he had this 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 like web show where they would like reenact famous like kills and things yeah. like that. And the first episode was uh that, that one from Late to Rest. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. um Chrome Skull, he was a uh, you know, he, he's such a uh badass killer, but for at the same time, if he was played the wrong way, he could have easily have gone down as like one of those you know, slasher tropes that you were kind of referring to earlier. And, um, you know, he could just been another slasher that people kind of forgot about. So why do you think people connected with him? And what did you bring out, bring to him, to that character? Like, what did you try to bring to that character to make him stand out? If filmmakers knew the things like what you started your sentence off with, like what made this character like that, if filmmakers knew what that was they would do it in every movie um <laughs> yeah I, I i don't think you 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 set out to do that i just think it's one of those beautiful like serendipitous kind of moments where you're like i think that's fucking cool and yeah. i fucking love horror movies mm -hmm. so most likely other people who fucking love horror movies will also dig this yeah. you know um another thing is his mask is a skull can't go wrong with a skull everybody fucking loves skulls skulls are just kind of fucking cool you know they represent so many different things like you know the idea of death staring you in the face almost or these kind of things on a shirt. um and he was i think it's just very simple and i'm always against a backstory um i think not knowing is always going to be more scary than when you get like a backstory and if you're going to do a backstory it's got to be fucking awesome you know, um, I think not having a backstory, at least that's how we started the first movie, just yeah. makes them way scarier if you don't know someone's motivations. And what I just like, you know, evil, evil is a fucking good enough reason for anything. Plot them down. Yeah. As far as what I brought to it is they're like, oh, you know, did you did you research this? You research? I'm like, I don't have to fucking research this. I've been waiting for this part my whole life, mm -hmm. you know. I just took my love of the genre and tried to like, just not do the things I hate. I didn't have a set goal of doing the stuff that I wanted. I had a set goal of not doing the things I didn't like in other movies. Yeah. And I just hoped that, that, that my passion for this sub genre just transcended the screen. And, and yeah, man, like, it's just so cool when like, you know, I see a kid wearing like a cannibal Holocaust shirt or a fucking Jason six shirt, like, you know, all this shit that I you know, still wear to this day at 42, 
Mm-hmm. And like a kid says something like, he's just like, he's like, you know, I've read stuff like about you. He's like, you know, it's like you, you were a horror nerd just like us. And I'm like, I wasn't one. I am one, yeah. you yeah. know? And, and I think like, no matter where you are in this world, if you're in like a third world village or fucking bumfuck New England or the Midwest, Canada, whatever, the power of the VHS tape or DVD and things how it just captivates a mind you 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 put it on a pedestal a little too much and you're like well i could never do that you know well why couldn't you do that why why couldn't you did you try oh you didn't try oh okay but when kids would say that it's just so heartwarming man you know because if i can give anybody any kind of hope growing up anywhere who thinks that they're just stuck in a certain kind of life and there's no way to get out of it it's not true you just got to work a little bit harder than the next guy and you could literally do practically anything you want there's a lot to be said when you're just very passionate about something and you just work very very hard you keep your head down and you focus on your work and then one minute you're down and it doesn't look that great but then you lift your head up from working and you look around and it's like wow we're you know, where did all this stuff come from? And it's like, oh, this just came from my deep love for what I'm doing, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's like that old saying, like, you know, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And, you know, that that's true when you get on the projects that you really care about. And that was this, you know? Um, It wasn't even meant to have sequels. When we shot that first movie, it's not like we were like, franchise! (laughs) Like, we just wanted to make a cool slasher movie yeah. with kind of notes. I think this is kind of what I brought to it is one of my favorite sub genres of horror is Jallo. And I, I think I tried to put Very cool. just a touch of like that European flavor to it, even if it's just like the lighting and things like that, or just small head movements and things, shit like that, you know? And Rob really trusted me. He he let me do yeah. whatever I wanted. And if I went too far with it, he would just he would pull me back a little bit. He was just like, he's like, you really think Crumstow would do something like that? And I was like, <laughs> well, I guess when you put it that way, I guess he wouldn't. So it's like you do some other shit, you know, until you find that pattern. And then we killed him off in the second one. And they were like, we got to make another one. I'm like, no. I'm like, I will do it if we find a way to not make him supernatural, I'm like, I think that's just fucking stupid. If we have this character like this and then we like bring him back from the dead and all this shit. So it just like kind of became my mission to figure out a believable way to bring him back, but still make it like fun. So I actually, uh, I have a buddy who's a professor of English at uh, UCLA and I went to their medical division and this dude showed me this guy in the Ukraine who was hunting bears and a bear literally like swiped his face. Like he was just a jaw. Like all of this, his face was gone from a bear pole. And they're like, you know, this guy, he, he lived. Uh, we had to reconstruct, they reconstruct the bone. He's got like a snap on face. And what it came down to is, he's just like, he's like, you know, if your brain didn't get too fucked up, then yeah, you could live through getting your entire face bashed in. I was like, that's the angle we're going to do. I'm like, I got a medical guy to prove it. So we talked to him and I think it just added to like the craziness of Chrome Skull because I almost saw him this, (laughs) it's kind of goofy. You know, the character Vega from Street Fighter 2? Yeah. Okay. You know why he wore that mask? Because no. he was super, super vain, but he wanted to be a fighter and he was scared that his face would get fucked up. So he wore like this iron mask. Okay. So I kind of saw Chrome Skull as this just super vain, rich guy, didn't value life at all. And he wore this protective mask that also instilled fear and all this shit. And then what's the worst thing you could do to someone who's vain? You know, take away their yeah. beauty. And that's what we do with Chrome Skull. And that's where I thought we could amp up his craziness if he's fucking distorted and ugly and figured and now has to rely on this mask like 24-7. That would make an unstable, crazy person unhinged and even fucking crazier. 
you know? Sure. So that was that. So in 2019, there started an Indiegogo campaign for Late to Rest 3. Um, I think it was called Exhumed, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, so I remember seeing, you know, seeing the Indiegogo video of, um, you know, Robert Greenhall just kind of talking about the film. And I was just curious, do you know, did that, did anything ever get off the ground with that? I know they raised a little bit of money. I checked it today, actually. It, you know, it didn't make its goal. It didn't look like as far as I could tell. Um, but, and were you, were you slated to be a part of that pro, uh, project? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, this is, it's, it's tough bringing about this because there's a lot of things I don't know. And I don't want to go off assumption. Yeah, sure. But Rob definitely had some issues with things. And I, you're like the second person to tell me that there even was like a GoFundMe or an Indiegogo or whatever. To my yeah. knowledge, before, it had only been when he made some masks. I remember he made like, he made like 50 chrome skull masks because they were starting to get bootlegged somehow and they were fucking terrible looking. And I was like, dude, if you're going to do it, you have to do it now. Like give people a proper mask. If you, if, you know, if you're going to sell, if somebody's going to sell something, it should come from you. You know, he's like, Oh, well maybe he's like, I'll make some and then we'll, you know, we'll use the money for like the third film or whatever. I was like, great. And that was like kind of the last I heard of it. And then like, he had asked me to, he mailed me a mask to like take a picture with it and do some stuff. To my knowledge, that was all that I knew about that. Um, Indiegogo and those things are great. But for something like this, in my opinion, it's just kind of digital panhandling. No. Like if we were like ready to go, it's, it's hard to get an investor for like an original film or this, that, and the other, but when you've got an established film and you're trying to complete a trilogy, it's not that hard to obtain money to get it done. You know, um, he just had very, very specific things. And I, I, I don't know all the ins and out of it, but he definitely like had his own little reasonings of why he wasn't accepting like other people's money for it and stuff. And he wanted it like, sourced and all through that but basically man for like the past like fucking eight years every six months you'd be like get ready here we go here we go we're shooting the third one i'm like okay let me know yeah you know because it, it's very very frustrating because you know i want it just as much as anybody else would but when people are like so when's the third one coming when's the third one coming it's it's very tough because it's like i'm not writing it I'm not producing it. Yeah. I, I'm I'm acting in it, and I'm very stoked for them to give me a start date. But other than that, I I really can't tell you. It seems you know? like that that would be actually like the downfall to the Indiegogo is like it almost leaks the information too soon, and then people yeah, are you know, like, and, and you know, it works in some people's favor quite a bit, and then other times it's like look like in the industry that shit's kind of like frowned upon. It's almost like it's looked at as like, oh, you couldn't get like real investors for the movie. You had to fucking digitally fucking beg. You know, it's not a good look. It's not. And even sometimes like there's been websites, they'll even say like, you know, the horror film funded by GoFundMe. And it's like, I don't know if they're intentionally kind of making a dig, but to people who work in the industry, that's definitely kind of a dig. Okay. You know? It seems but, like, like go fund like Indiegogo and GoFundMe work well for like fan films made by like up and coming producers Great. and everything putting things together, you know. But like you said, it kind of is a frown upon from like a big production, especially something that can like end like a great trilogy from like two great films. So, see, like, well, the thing is, is when you're making a movie, unless you have a distribution company, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be like Universal, or Warner Brothers, or things like that has to just be a production company that's funding your movie so when you're making that movie you know no matter what it's coming out it's going to get released you know but the more indies you have to raise the money yourself you shoot it yourself and then you have to take it on the festival circuit 
which is a blessing and a curse because that's like the best advertisement you can ever get is going through the festival circuit because that's how you build a buzz for something. Now, doing a movie and then having to try to sell it to a distribution company, it's a fucking nightmare. But something like this that already has global distribution waiting for it, I, I just didn't see a how it was necessary. I mean, you can always get more money, but it's just, just kind of weird to me. But um, I guess at the end of the day, whatever it takes to just get it done, then by all means, you know. But uh, yeah, it's not the route that I would have taken, but I don't even know. I don't know at this point, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, well, you know what? It, in retrospect, it was, from what I read, it was intended to be kind of like give the background, the backstory. And like you said, maybe it's better off to not know the backstory because it kind of preserves the character a bit. So the, the idea that, that that we went off of was um, we didn't think this is coming from the guy who wrote it, not me, that Chrome uh, Skull wasn't in it enough in the second movie, I thought. Um, I was like, you know, nobody wants to see this fucking Brian Austin fucking schmuck fucking putting on my mask and pretend killing people i'm like they want the fucking real shit man yeah and um i think that was going to be the focus like he was going to be in los angeles and hollywood and um uh the ideas that we had it was just going to be him in hollywood just fucking just tearing through people like not really paying attention too much to like the second film. I think uh, Thomas Derrick's character was going to pop in there for like a little bit, just try to establish some new things, things like that, and then just wrap it up, you know? Um, I mean, there's some ideas I'd, I'd love to even talk about, but they could still happen. So yeah. I don't really want to yeah. say it. Yeah, for like, sure. Publicly. Um, but I don't know much about because I mean, he still hasn't had a service. Um, is is the remains were just like sent back like recently, and before I even think about any of that kind of stuff, but uh, let's get him in the ground first. No. Let his family kind of digest everything that happened. Not that it's ever that pain will ever go away because it doesn't. But before we talk about licensing and movies, I'd much rather just mourn his loss grieve had the service and then you know just just down the road um i'm sure it's either his brother or his mother will take over the rights and then we'll we'll talk about you know getting the movie off the ground in his honor you know and it might happen a little smoother because we won't be as maybe as stubborn as as rob was because rob was just like i have a vision it's going to happen exactly like this. And if it doesn't, well, then it just doesn't get fucking made. You know? Yeah. That, that, that's a tough way to go into things. I get it and I respect the shit out of it. You know? But I think now it, it might be easier to do it. But it, it, that's like, it's a conversation maybe like four months to six months down the road, you know? And then, uh, you know, because... I mean, I'm never going to direct these things, but I'd like to maybe fill in some blanks with writing. And of course, like, even if for some reason, if I gave up acting and stunts, I would always come back as Chrome Skull. I mean, Chrome Skull, that's, that's, it's like one of the only things in life that I kind of like set out to do. And I went out and actually fucking did it, you know? We'd love to see it, man. So, you know, down the road, you know? hopefully that can be revisited. Yeah. That's awesome. It'll, I always said it'll happen. I just couldn't tell you when. Yeah. You know, it's because it's funny in Germany, they would be like, we have those talks of no leads the rest. When will it be filmed? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, you will tell me when. I know you know. <laughs> well, they'll put you on the hook. You know, big time. But let me, let me give you, have you ever heard a, you ever heard a Nazi knock knock joke? This is no. Good. Uh, <laughs> ready? no, 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 it's not what you think it is. It's not okay. what you think it is. Okay, ready? <laughs> knock, knock. Who's there? We will ask you the questions. <laughs> <laughs> so you're supposed to slap the person and stick your finger in the face and say, we, you know, so it doesn't work over the phone. Yeah, yeah, no, it's good though. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> but please take it 
run with it, do something with it. <laughs> Let it live it's on. Definitely, I, I heard it at like 4 a.m. drunk, and I thought it was like the funniest thing yeah, I heard yeah. in months. So yeah. I suggest <laughs> passing it on at 4 a.m. after a, a few libations. <laughs> Gives you a reason to slap someone too, so that's good. There you that's go. Awesome. <laughs> so so we got we got one last question for you and i'm gonna let josh take the the reins on this one because this is his sure. thing josh yeah do you so throw down man i call throw down every week and i take two horror characters and just have people vote on who would win if it actually happened um so l- let's take chrome skull who would be an awesome opponent for chrome skull Okay, we've had, I've had these talks before, right? And sadly, I'm sure when you talk to most people who play like a horror guy, they're going to be like, I'd kick his ass. I'd kick his ass. Okay, Chrome Skull ain't taking out Jason. That ain't happening. Okay. I don't really like Chromey's chances against Michael Myers either. Don't yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, he's a human being. You know, so he definitely ain't taking out Freddy. Yeah. Um, I like my odds against the Scream Ghost. Fuck, I would fuck that dude up. Yeah, you would. Yeah, you up. would. No problem. <laughs> Which one? Chucky. I think I got Chucky beat all day. Yeah. Uh, Leslie Vernon, I met in person. He's like 5'2". He gets the boot done. <laughs> um, I'm making the last Sadly, I get it. That one. Who? What is it? Who? Like Vernon. I like that. He's a that that oh, was, it's a, good that movie. was a, great movie. It's a great movie. Yeah. Um Victor Crowley, sadly again, I think Victor would fucking whip Chrome Skull's ass. There was actually talks about a comic book at one point. Oh yeah. Of Chrome Skull versus uh Crowley. Yeah. That yeah, would yeah, be- yeah. It was just gonna like take Chrome Skull like hunting some girls into like yeah. the bayou. And then uh, you know, he runs into it. But it, you know, <laughs> it's like one of the many things that you talk about, it just never happened. And then uh, another interesting thing was Rob, because he did the effects on the collection. I swear to God, I was going to say the collector. I swear to God, I was going to say that. Yes. <laughs> See? Yeah. So there was talk about a possible move, a movie yeah. with Chrome Skull versus a collector, but I never saw that really come into light, you know, but I would have fucked that guy up. I think I would have yeah, fucked that yeah. guy up too. That would have been that would have been a cool little yeah. uh now the magic. funny thing, one last goofy story. Um so that came out. I think fans kind of heard that he did the effects on the collection. There was dude, Google this when you get a chance. It's enlightening. There is a bunch of erotic art dedicated to Crumb Skull. And the collector. <laughs> Things, everything just as simple as the two of them enjoying coffee <laughs> to walking hand in hand to uh, some penetration. Wow. And I'm just glad to be the giver in that situation. Yeah. <laughs> but there you go. You know, but there is like, and my wife brought this to my attention to me over Christmas because, you know, me and the internet, we're not friends. <laughs> but she said, she's like, there's all this like erotic. Chrome Skull fiction that like people write, and a lot of it has to do with the collector. Like some really wild fucking shit. And I was just so flattered, so flattered. (laughs) You know? (laughs) Too funny, yeah. You know? So the joke. Yeah, I guess that's the question. I got collector, Chucky, Ghostface, Leslie Vernon. How about the prowler? Oh yeah, I, I like my odds against any any human. Yeah, yeah. As soon as we get into supernatural, with the exception of Chucky, I think I'm in I'm in trouble. Okay. Um, sure, like your Prowler or your Miner from Bloody Valentine, yeah, maybe yeah. even the twins from Just Before Dawn. Uh, yeah, you know, as soon as it, as soon as it gets supernatural, man, I think uh, old Chromie's out of luck. Okay. Yeah. All right. You know? Good answer. Good answer. So. All right, so I mean, this has been an amazing interview. Yeah, if there's Nick, anything else, man, fucking feel free. Nick, Ask I'm gonna. I'm, I I'll hope tell you anything you want to know. I hope that you know what I'm gonna. I'm just gonna say this while we're recording, so that everybody can hear it. But like, when you and Tom end up making your film, I hope you both will join us, or definitely you need to come back on 
whenever, yeah. whenever yeah, you got man. something going on, please feel free to come by. Well, yeah, I, well, maybe. Well, we're going to be awesome. shooting that in Rhode Island in October. Oh, cool. So I don't know if you guys do like any kind of in person stuff or yes. something. Yeah. But we were doing horror movie nights once a month. So, yeah, right. yeah. We, we love to, man. So definitely, so, yeah. When I when I'm in town, absolutely, man, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, there's another movie I, I wanted to plug too. It's actually um, I don't have anything in July, but in August, um, I'm doing this really cool indie movie called Night of the Bastard, which is like definitely like a play on like uh, like the late '80s like Satanic Panic, okay, kind of thing about like this like desert town in California um, that had like this you know satanic cult trying to take over and like all these kind of things but um it's got london may who acts who's been acting for for a while now um but he was the drummer for sam hain okay. uh, like danzig and all that and then uh he's presently the drummer for uh ministry but it's something that that he's starring in um i believe charles manson's son is going to be in the movie um and Vigo Mordstein's son and I don't, there's a handful of other like like horror folk or whatever in it too and then a bunch of people from rock and roll are going to be in it but it's going to be really interesting um so we're shooting that in August out in the middle of fucking nowhere um so that should be interesting so I just wanted to shout that out quick Excellent. London thank you respect thank but uh yeah let's definitely set something up for uh October hopefully uh the world is as back to normal as possible have you guys come out to the set maybe be extras or something like that what do you think oh, would love it would love it Down for that <laughs> you can set that up yeah whatever level of comfortability you want you can get killed by me or just kind of be standing around we'll figure something out awesome that sounds <laughs> so, uh, amazing you got my email you got my cell phone yep. number stay in touch boys i wish you awesome. guys all the best awesome all right, man appreciate it so uh just wanted to say to all the listeners if you guys haven't seen the movies we discussed today particularly late to rest go and watch them amazing films nick thank you again for for being here today and you know signing off this is dave this is joshua this is brandon this is nick Prince, and you've been watching the pvd horror cast the only horror podcast worth listening to that's from Rhode Island. You don't understand how big that is. I fucking screamed like a little girl for tech support. Hey, my wife. <laughs> I'm like, why? That thing not work. That thing not work. That thing not work. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, I hit it three times. So anyways, I said nothing, and then I got a tattoo of their logo, like, right by my asshole. <laughs> and I just took a picture, and I sent it to him. And then, like, major death threats. Like, oh, I, shit. It was nuts. I just wanted to mention it, but, other, I mean, if you guys really want to talk about it. Well, I think we all got means. all we need, man. Thank you. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this has been the PVD <laughs> Juggalos signing off. <laughs> <laughs> So I had I had literally no idea about any of that general chip. Yeah. That's awesome. That oh, is it's probably because you're a grown up. I'm just <laughs> yeah. <you> know. <laughs> <laughs> don't kill him, right? Whatever happens is up to you, but don't let your time run out. Game over. You lose.